The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world in America. The rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio. Welcome to episode 143 of Cars and Culture. It's good to have you back listening again. I'm your host, Jason Stein. One word in the industry, especially the industry of fast cars and wow factors, stirs the senses like few others. Remac. It's all about brutal asphalt ripping speed. It's all about beautiful design. And it's all about a Croatian engineer who had an idea in mind to build a better electric car. Mate Rimac is the quintessential dreamer who had a vision for a better car company and then went out and just did it. Oh, and not just at a snail's pace, but at the speed of sound. Hypercars, to be more precise. Rimac is well on its way to becoming an incredible success story, already admired so much that it's folded into the Volkswagen Group family and making its mark on the development of several new vehicles, including new Bugattis that are on the way. But first, let's hear his story. The one of starting out with a dream of being the first Croatian car company on the planet, then doing it, and now creating history at every turn. In this rare interview, Cars and Culture goes to the Toronto Auto Show to meet up with Mate and listen to his tale of success and hardship and a mountain of momentum with more than a thousand employees, yet only 15 years old. His is a unique story of hypercars and success. The story of Remac on Cars and Culture. Hi, my name is Mate Rimac. I'm the founder and CEO of Rimac Automobili, now Rimac Group, and also CEO of Bugatti Rimac. This is Cars and Culture with Jason Stein. Mate, what a pleasure to be with you here in Toronto, sitting in front of one of your prized possessions that I know that we're going to talk about. But, uh, but first, it is, it is great to have you on the program. Uh, you are cars and culture, in my opinion, and we're gonna we're gonna talk a lot about the cultural aspect of it as well. But but first, tell me how proud you are to be sitting here in in front of the Nevera and um, and on all of the world records that you broke last year, and and this is one of just a few that are actually one of two in Canada and one of a few in the world, right? Yeah, well, for me it's a bit mixed feelings. Like on one side, of course, I'm super proud looking at the car. On the other side you learn so much by going through a process of development of a car and I'm one of the very few people in the world who did that multiple times from ground up because usually you know in car manufacturers you start with an existing car that you modify or like you, you slightly adapt it or it's a facelift or you know you combine engines or platforms from other cars and so on. I was lucky enough to witness multiple times now completely new cars developed from scratch. Nevera was one of them and along the journey you learn so much because when I started this journey, I had no idea about cars. You know, I, well, I was a normal car guy, but I was not from the car industry. So when I look at the Nevera, I'm immensely proud of what started just as an idea in this head. Now, you know, there's a bunch of carbon and uh, aluminum and copper and uh, titanium and whatever right. that uh, sits right here and can do crazy things. But on the other side, it's also so much pain that we had to go through to build at the same time the team, the company, the processes, the facility, the uh, shareholders, get the money on board, you know, everything to make this car happen. So it was also a lot of pain, blood, sweat and tears, as they say, to get this car uh, on the ground uh, and ultimately being what it is today. So yeah, it's a long, long journey from, you know, that idea in, in somebody's head until it actually stands here. Let's go back to the idea that was in your head. You're seemingly someone who's come out of nowhere to some extent to, to now build these vehicles that are in, in high demand, get a lot of conversation about them. They perform at, at incredible levels. Why the idea? How the idea? Take the listener through that. Well, you know, first of all, I was just a car guy, like I guess so many of the listeners here, uh, from basically when I was born and there was really no precondition to it because I was born in an area where there were basically no cars so at that time it was still Yugoslavia in 1988 and where I'm from that what's today Bosnia so Bosnia is basically the second poorest country in Europe and where I'm from is the poorest part of, of Bosnia so 
uh, there were almost no roads, almost no cars, and my parents had nothing to do with cars, so, but somehow I was really obsessed with cars since before I could walk or talk. And I wanted to do something with cars all my life, uh, whether being a race car driver, Formula One driver, designer, engineer, I cycled through all of it, and I tried to absorb everything like a sponge, what's about cars. And, um, one of the lucky things that happened was that we moved to Germany because the war started in, in Yugoslavia at that time, so my parents moved to Germany and there, you know, there were a bunch of cars and they had a car culture, like lots of magazines, uh, TV shows, I was watching all of them uh, and tried to, to learn as much as I could. Ten years later, when I was 12 years old, we moved back to, to Croatia, but uh, that, that stuck with me and um, then when I was 18 years old, I bought a 1984 BMW. Uh, that eventually blew up the engine and I converted it to an electric car and so on. So I, I just wanted to do something with cars, anything. And I, I was a huge BMW fan. Like my, my uh, big dream was to work for a BMW one day. And you know, I'm lucky today that what I'm doing is much more exciting than just being an engineer for BMW. By the way, we also work now right. with BMW and many other brands. But why I decided to do exactly this is because in Croatia, uh, so over 100 years ago, Nikola Tesla was born. He invented the electric motor that we are using everywhere today. And being a Croatian, I read a lot about him and his motor. And at that time, so in 2008, 2009, electric cars weren't the thing. And I was wondering why nobody makes electric cars that are exciting. So I wanted to do that with my BMW where I blew the engine up to show that electric cars can be fun and exciting. And that, you know, in the future when someday, combustion engines won't be around anymore, that there's still space for enthusiasts to enjoy their cars. And that's, I think, what's special about the Nevera. Even people who don't like electric cars, when they try the Nevera, they're like, wow, this car was built by proper car guys. Like, this is fun. Right, yeah. And it's exciting. Like Chris Harris, you know, he is not really a huge fan of electric cars, but he loved the Nevera and he was blown away by it. Um, and, but it's, for me, it's not just about electric. So. That's, let's say, one part of my journey where I did the craziest things with electric cars you could do. Like, now it's accepted that electric cars are, are fast and all of that stuff. But 15 years ago, when I started, it would have been impossible to imagine an electric car would be fast and fastest combustion cars, fastest hybrids, whatever. And that's actually what the Nevera is. It's the fastest accelerating car ever built. And, uh, but, but I'm not religious about electric. So now, you know, Bugatti is also part of the story. And you will see it in a few months, the, the success of the Chiron, which is, you know, from the last bolt, from, from the first to the last bolt was, you know, I, I've led that project and uh, was really, again, an idea in this head. And you will see it has a very interesting combustion engine, very big one. Uh, so I'm just about doing cool stuff for, uh, with cars, not because of a particular, let's say, technology or whatever, be just because, I think in the end, like, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist and I believe that cars are kind of the culmination of all the human uh, disciplines. On one side, art, because they have to be beautiful, but not just in terms of looking at them, but also, you know, the way it feels when you touch a button, the way it feels when you open a door, the way it sounds when you close the door, the way it smells in the car. You know, it's like a lot of sensory experiences, but then also all of the sciences, like material science and uh, aerodynamics and composites and software and electronics, everything is in the car. Everything humanity is doing is in the car. And it's an arms race between so many smart people in the world, so many manufacturers. So I think that's why I got excited about cars initially as a kid. And I kind of feel if you push in the right direction and do cool and exciting stuff and people get the opportunity to understand the people behind them, uh, that new generations would be excited about it as well. Let's go back to that 18-year-old, though, that was the BMW engineer. W where does the big break come from? How do you go from, from that, that kind of role that you would take to where we sit today? Well, it's, there's no like, single big moment. It's just 15 years of like, ups and downs. And I mean, <laughs> our story of like, the chance of me starting a car company in Croatia where there is zero, there was zero auto industry before, um, at least, I mean, there are some small suppliers, but no, no right. really car industry, or it was one of the least developed, if not the least developed 
European countries when it comes to, to automotive industry. There was no investors, no talent, no, no uh, market, no government support. So, uh, and I didn't know one single person in the auto industry. I didn't know anybody. So the chances of getting here were like 0.00, .00 and it was an incredibly difficult journey. Like I could tell you so many near-death experiences for the company. Um, that I'm really brand marked by it and, and kind of like I have PTSD from it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, it maybe the biggest, I would say, reason for it to, to happen was when the engine of the BMW originally blew up, I actually wanted to put in a combustion, another combustion engine, like V8 from an e uh, uh, E39 M5 at that time. But first of all, it was too expensive for me. But second, I was like, this will take a lot of my time, a lot of effort, and it's going to be difficult. So when I'm already doing it, why not do something that could also turn out into a business? So I thought at the time, and I was following uh, Tesla. Mm -hmm. uh, so Tesla just started. It was like totally under the radar. Nobody really knew about it. Elon Musk was not on the, on the radar. It was Martin Eberhardt and Mark Tarpening who were the original two founders. And I was following it, and I was like, this could go somewhere. And I followed the scene of people who were converting their cars to electric in the US and racing them. So there was a small community of people like DIYers who were doing this kind of stuff. And I thought, when I'm already doing this, okay, I want performance and I want to do something cool, but let's do something that can turn into a business. And actually my first company that I founded at that time was built to um, convert combustion engine cars to electric. Quickly I realized that that's a bad business, both technically and financially. And then I decided to build my own car and so on. But I think that was really the key where I was like, okay, I'm going to do something that's going to take a lot of effort from me, a lot of time. So let's do something that could also be a business and not just a hobby. And yeah, I took from there. How did you assemble the team that ultimately led to where we are today? Well, so... Because as you said, you're coming from an area where, where uh, it's not really automotive centric. Yeah, when I actually... I was like, okay, I want to build my own car. And I was just, you know, self-taught in a garage. I right. was actually like, just when I started with this, I was just finishing high school and started university. And I went to the University of Mechanical Engineering in Zagreb, which is like the closest to something automotive um, in, in Croatia, or it's called actually of Mechanical Engineering and Naval Engineering, so like boats, because Croatia had a boating industry. Um, like after the war, that fell apart as well. But uh, I told him, look guys, I want to build a car in Croatia. I want to build an electric supercar. And they told me, it's impossible to build a car in Croatia. The sooner you give up, the less people will go under with you. And I was like, okay, that's very encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but you know, being, uh, I, I think, you know, determination, like uh, doing your own thing and not listening to naysayers, this is a, something that's very important if you want to do something like this. So I actually, uh, knew a couple of guys that were good with their hands and did did stuff not in automotive industry but for example my first colleague i wouldn't even call him an employee like the guy who was working with me in the garage igor he was a great um uh, self-taught engineer and and manufacturing guy because during the war in croatia croatia had an embargo on weapons they couldn't buy weapons so he was responsible in the army to develop and make drones and operate them. So he had to develop and make drones in Croatia without any, you know, real infrastructure for it, without the, again, the know-how, a similar story, right? So <coughs> he was super skilled. And then another guy was a corporate guy, but in his free time, he was building electric bicycles in his, in his garage. And then a third guy, he was building race cars. So these were like the initial people, like super enthusiastic, you know, uh, um, non-corporate, but zero experience from the auto industry. So we were just like building the company on, um, how would I say, people who had no idea about this, but were just thinking, let's say, uh, common sense. But there's only so far you can get with common sense. So at the beginning, I couldn't afford to hire foreigners, like, I don't know, like an Italian from Ferrari or, or some Germans who worked in the German auto industry. I just couldn't afford any of that. So it took years for us until we were financially stable enough and I had the first investors on board and so on until we could hire the experienced ones. But oftentimes those with impressive CVs turned out to be nowhere near as good as just these guys who loved 
to do you know we were always having this inferior complex like first of all like all aspirations we are not nearly as good as germans or whatever that was false <laughs> and you know then thinking like uh we we have we, like we are far inferior just because we have never worked in the auto industry okay yes that's also a problem because you only learn in your own mistakes which is the worst way of learning but uh you make up for it in you know just enthusiasm and and uh, curiosity and unconventional solutions but it it helps to have the experience so now we are like we have a lot of people from the auto industry from all possible manufacturers um which How is many good employees do you have now two and a half thousand wow wow or two and a half thousand so you go from the garage to two and a half thousand yeah in 15 years yeah amazing yeah uh, does is somebody like christian van koningsegg who's been on this program is is he an inspiration because it's kind of the same thing isn't it it's coming from sweden and wanting to build hypercars and wanting to do something different and starting with two hands yeah well actually Horacio Pagani and Christian Koenigs are my big heroes together with Nikola Tesla. And I'm lucky you know that I know both of them very well now. I would even consider them friends. Uh, with Koenigs we worked also a lot. The Regera had a right. battery that was right. one of our first bigger projects uh, that we that we did let's say first for for a serious production car even though very small volume. And uh, that was actually really the inspiration like when I was doing the BMW I was like this doesn't make sense. And you know I had a few customers who I converted their cars to electric and i realized like that really doesn't make sense technically and commercially so it only makes sense to really develop a car from scratch that's going to be designed around the idea of electric propulsion so four motors batteries in the floor and all that stuff and i knew that there were two guys who did it Horatio and Christian and actually you know i i tried to read everything about them uh, you know that's a huge advantage of st stuff like this today like you didn't have this information right back then i mean the world changed so much it's difficult to think back like how different the world was just 15 years ago like you know now you have like this shows and podcasts of horatio and christian and me and people like us and you you can learn a bit about them but i know i wanted to meet christian and i went to the geneva auto show without knowing how he looks like and i was going to the most senior looking guy at the Königsegg stand and it was actually his father, oh. Jesko. And he was such a nice guy. Yes. He listened to this, you know, uh, kid. I mean, I, I was like, I don't know, 18, 19, but I looked even a lot younger, you know. Uh, so, you know, this kid who wants to build his own car. So he listened to me and he gave me Christian's email. Then I wrote everything to Christian. I still have these emails today. Um, actually, I must say, uh, looking back at it now, I incredibly looked quite professional what I wrote to Christian <laughs> and that got him you know in interested then when I actually had the first employees I took the whole company I remember like I had a Volkswagen Passat and we we all jumped in the car and we went for a factory tour in, in uh, Pagani in Modena and uh, that was a huge thing for me like Pagani at that time was like 40 employees and I was like man if we could be one day like Pagani like that would be amazing like but that was that seems so far-fetched yeah, now we are. Are you? You feel that you're closer now, a lot closer. Well, you know, today we are two and a half thousand employees. Pagani is like two hundred. Uh, right. Not not that like number of employees really uh, equals. Uh, but even in terms success. of stature, in stature, I mean, you've you've grown this. You've you've developed now a culture for a vehicle, right? You've yeah. The the proof is in the product. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody's. Like, you know, I don't consider anybody competition. It's, right. I really consider everybody in industry friends. Uh, we are super open, like everybody can come to us and see everything we do. And believe me, both Christian and Horatio are multiple times also there and everybody else in the industry basically. So, so I'm very happy to collaborate with anyone. And, um, you know, Horatio has positioned Pagani so uniquely. It's basically art. He's not in this arms race of yeah, uh, technology and performance. The cars are good and they are performing well, but it's more about the artistic side. While Koenigsegg is all about crazy ideas and making them happen. Um, so the Riemann is a bit like that, but now with, let's say, Bugatti, I also have a second canvas to, uh, to draw on, which is a bit differently positioned um, than, than the two others. How did the partnership come about that, that you would become involved with Bugatti and that, and that you would now have um, the Volkswagen Group uh, by your side? So as I was building the business, initially, like we were, I couldn't get any investors. So that was the most difficult thing. Like there were no investors in Croatia. 
and foreign investors, they didn't want to invest in electric cars, first of all, because at that time they already burned their fingers uh, with uh, like Fisker and a bunch of others that went bankrupt. And when they heard Croatia, like what? They never thought about investing in Croatia. And then third, there was like just a 20 year old guy with a few, few other like 20 year olds in his garage. Yeah. Uh, and but as we were proving ourselves, we started to work for other car companies. We started to get business, we started to get revenue and we were basically self-funding, but just barely, barely surviving, like always being late with paying the, the rent and suppliers and stuff like that it was really a struggle. But then, you know, some investors joined us and one of the first was Porsche. So they invested in 2018, which was for the first time that they ever invested in a company. And that was a huge deal for us. So in the whole journey of the 15 years, that was one of the biggest, if not the biggest single events that, you know, got us where we are today, where it was basically seal of approval. Then everybody was like, okay, if Porsche invests in these guys, they are something special, they know what they're doing. And Porsche actually invested five times in total in our company. So over the years, they invested more and more as we were working closer and closer together. And then at some point, you know, the Volkswagen Group had a lot of change. So uh, Ferdinand Piech, mm -hmm. who was the long-term patriarch of Volkswagen, he, he was not there anymore, then he passed away. And then there was Dieselgate. And Volkswagen Group was going all the way with Herbert Dies especially into electrification 100%. And, folk, uh, and Bugatti just didn't fit into that picture. First of all, electrification, like how are they going to do it? And second of all, uh, in such a gigantic group, like the Volkswagen Group, which actually, if you think about it, has four times more revenues than Croatia's GDP. Mm. So a single company has four times more revenues <laughs> than Croatia. No, all of Croatia's GDP. <laughs> all of the five or four, four million uh, inhabitants of Croatia. And uh, so they were, not sure what's the future for for Bugatti and how they can lead it to to the next stage. And they were thinking about multiple options, and somebody had the idea. Well, there's this guy in Croatia who's already building electric sports cars because they actually thought that the next Bugatti has to be electric, which I strongly disagreed with actually. And you will see that the next one will not be fully electric; it will mm -hmm. be a hybrid car. Mm -hmm. And they were like, "Okay, we have already a relationship with these guys through through Porsche, so it." It was an interesting idea to explore. But I then learned in such a huge company is that there, is not a, there was no opinion of the company. There was many opinions of many different people. And not many agreed with um, that idea of bringing us together. That's the right thing to do. But in the end, it turned out to be an absolute win-win for all sides. So it was a win for Bugatti, a win for Imats, a win for Porsche, a win for Volkswagen, wow. for the employees. It works beautifully works beautifully. How, how will that collaboration lead to more innovation or to um, more advancements within the company? Well, it's not a collaboration. It's one company now. So Bugatti Rimac is one company. So I'm the CEO of that company, of both brands. It's one development team, one design team, um, but with two brands and two different locations uh, where we assemble Bugattis in, in Molsheim and uh, in Croatia, the Nevera. And also a lot of parts for Bugattis will be made in Croatia in the future. Um, well, innovation, it's just, you know, like the reason why I do this, like I really respect what the previous managements have done, especially Mr. Winkelmann, who brought all the variety of the models, you know, from the Chiron, they went to the Chiron Pure Sport, the Super Sport, the Cento Dieci, the one-off uh, La Voiture Noir, um, the, the Devo, yeah. and uh, that's exciting and nice, but it was not technical innovation, it was all based on the same platform. And if you look at the Chiron, it's an amazing car. I have one myself and really enjoy using it. Uh, but it's basically 20 years, the same technical platform. So the, the W16, the gearbox, the, the platform from the Veyron times is basically the same. And, you know, I don't want to invest years of my life and hard work into rebodying cars. So what I'm about is to do really exciting stuff. And I actually, so when, when, when this idea came up of joining forces with Bugatti, it was basically a blank sheet of paper. Like mm. anything could be done because the original plan of the management at that time was that the successor of the Chiron was supposed to be an electric uh, kind of SUV coupe like thing. And so anything was possible, SUV, electric, 
a supercar, a hypercar, a four-door, whatever. And we were thinking about everything. But I just think that Bugatti needs a hypercar, so the Chiron successor will be a hypercar. There could be other things for Bugatti as well, because the, the beauty with Bugatti is, with the history, it has all kinds of cars in, in the past, pre-war era. You know, you have the beautiful Royale, which is like this huge car from the 1920s uh, that, you know, basically Bugatti has a heritage also in luxury, not just in, in performance. Right. But I, I think just the, you know, core of Bugatti has to be a hypercar. And you will see with the new one, uh, it's very innovative actually, not just from, let's say, the powertrain perspective, but also lots of technical solutions that are, that are in there. And, and it's just like, for me, the driving force to do all of this, you know, because it's hard work and you invest your life in it, you know, five years, six years, that's what it takes to develop a car. And, you know, two or three of these programs and your youth is gone. Right, you right, know? right. So, so when I do it, I want to do something exciting. Right. And that's, that's why the new cars will be exciting. What are the characteristics that we'll see? So it, it's coming actually, so we have started to show the car to existing customers. Yeah. Um, we will publicly show it uh, in a few months. So what I can tell you is that we try to combine a very, uh, you know, when already combustion, then let's make it very emotional and very exciting. Uh, and on the other side, you have the electric powertrain for performance. So the electric is there more in the background because um, it gives you instant power. It gives you interesting uh, things that you, how you can control the car. For example, with the Nevera, we have four electric motors, right? So you can control each wheel separately. And you can do with that things that you cannot do with other cars. Like if you watch the, the Chris Harris test drive, like right. the way he was drifting the car and so on, it's just, you cannot do that with the traditional powertrain. So, so taking these advantages, but still having a very interesting and exciting uh, combustion engine, uh, I think that's, that's really the key. And then uh, I think the characteristic that you will see with the Shion successor is that it really s seems like it comes from one single person, like from one hand, where everything really works together. The powertrain, the design, the exterior, the interior, the aerodynamics, uh, it just like so well works together and fits together that it really looks like one uh, package that that just uh, works on all levels in a different way than other cars before. You've got to be enormously satisfied with where you are right now. Yeah, so, you know, I always say, but what I did before this company is high school. <laughs> and I didn't go to a fancy university, but I say that my shareholders have invested, invested hundreds of millions of euros into my education through what I'm doing. And with Nenuera, I learned so much, and it's an amazing car, but also I see lots of things that I could have done better. And now when I look at the Shiron successor, and you know, we spent now in Dubai, we had the first uh, silent launch with our first, so the customers come there, they can see the car before, uh, before the public. And we actually do that individually. So for every customer, we present them the car, show it around. And I was there for three, four days looking at the car all the time and I'm walking around it all the time thinking, what did we miss? What could we have done better? And I'm really self-critic. And when I look at that one, I'm like, I don't see anything. I don't see anything that we could have done better. It's like so amazing that we didn't make any compromise because when you start a new project, you usually have super high ambition when it comes to performance and technology and so on. Um, and usually like stuff falls off the table because you run out of time, money, talent, whatever. And with the Nevera, we actually have overshoot our targets. So when we presented the car initially, we set some performance numbers and nobody believed we could achieve it. And unfortunately we had, we were forced a bit with the Nevera to show it very early because we were not in a great financial situation. So we needed to, to show the car to customers, get the first customers on board very early in the program. While with the Bugatti, we now don't have that problem and show it pretty late. But nevertheless, all the crazy things that you'll see also in the interior and so on, that, that's really unseen uh, and unheard of in the industry, nothing fell off the table. So when I look at it, I'm really proud. Like, wow, we managed to pull it. We actually managed to pull this off. And that's, that's really a, a crazy achievement that, uh, that's such a, that so many things that, we, that, that are so special in this car, like the engine, like the interior, you'll see some of the things, uh, the suspension, those kind of stuff that we managed to pull it off. <laughs>
final thing, do you, do you have people thinking differently about Croatian automakers, uh, folks who can create something that's incredibly special? Oh yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why I did this and I made my life unnecessarily difficult because I really wanted to, to keep the company in Croatia and show that you can do something like that in Croatia, which was, as, as I told you, like pretty unimaginable. It's crazy that now, today, uh, you know, people consider it. I mean, even if you look at, well, so here in our background, people here, they have the training about our um, history and so on. And here we can see the picture of our campus uh, behind us. It's like a huge manufacturing facility where, you know, the newest technology in cars and, and batteries and so on is made for many car manufacturers. So car manufacturers from all around the world now come to, to a place where they would never have come before just because I started it there. But it made my life incredibly difficult. However, it really brought uh, a lot of positive things to the country. So they are now, you know, first of all, people saw it's possible. But then also, you know, investors have more um, confidence. Like when there is a new guy now, he can tell them there is already, you know, success stories out of the country. And it helped many of them. And actually also our partners, I uh, helped some of them to help uh, to find uh, some partners in Croatia, like other startups, to do other things like uh, uh, digital services or software development and stuff like that. So, so it, start, it created a little bit of a, of a little ecosystem. Some people who, you know, didn't want to stay in the company any longer or who wanted to be entrepreneurs themselves, you know, they learned a lot in the company and they set up their own thing and do their own thing and I'm trying to support them as well. So I definitely think it changes the country and, and if we succeed in our mission and in a few years we should be a significant portion of the Croatia of Croatia's GDP. So it actually is a full transformation of the country. So yeah it makes me proud but also a lot of the gray hair comes from that. Yeah. <laughs> Mate thank you so much for being on the program telling your story. Congratulations on having the vehicle here in uh, Toronto and, and best of luck in the future with all of your projects. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks again to my guest today, Remac founder Mate Remac. To see my interview with Mate Go to the Cars and Culture YouTube channel, like and subscribe to see more than 140 interviews and more than 1,200 videos. I'm Jason Stein. We'll see you down the road.